three, two. This is your Libertarian Crusaders podcast, episode number 11. Uh, we're going to talk about, actually, September 11. It's a very important day. It was the uh, Battle of Zenta. Prince uh, Eugeni of Savoy led the heavily outnumbered Catholics of the Holy League to victory against the Ottomans, restoring Christian rule to much of Central and Eastern Europe. All right. That's what everybody thinks about when they think about September 11th, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I knew exactly where you were going when we talked about what we were going to discuss. Uh, yes, <laughs> Prince oh, Magenta, yeah. yes. All right, <laughs> yeah. I think it's a very historic day. I think it's a day that sort of uh, lay in somber, of course, because uh, the following day <clears throat> is when the winged hussars attacked and saved Christian Europe at the Battle of Vienna um, and led by Polish King John Sobieski. Uh, arrived at the Battle of Vienna and crushed the Muslim invader, saving Christian Europe. And the entire city was under siege for like for about a month or something like that, for, for a long time. And at the very last moment of like the siege being broken, they just came in on horseback and you have that Sabaton uh, music score coming in there. Uh, and it was the largest cavalry charge in all of history that has, has ever faced this planet coming down there and uh, repelling them. So... Why did they wear the wings? If I like, if I take those wings off, will you die? <laughs> uh, so, the, the, do you know? Well, I don't exactly, but in I was stationed in South Korea, and they put ball bearings um, in the brazers of their boots. So when they run, it sounds like more of them than are actually coming. There, so there are tactics to make yourself look bigger or force more. Multiplier. Exactly. That's one of them, too. Uh, yeah. Another thing would be uh, the sound of it sounds like thunder. When you have all these horses with these uh, wings and the feathers and the way that they kind of clap, it sounds like an enormous thunder roar coming down the uh, mountainside. And it also helps with... Uh, deafening the horse's ears so they're not uh, tuned to like uh, spooked. yeah right. spooked by a war and all the cannon shot and everything being fired at them because uh, the way that they would work is with their like 17 uh, foot long lances uh, that come in and these horses are especially trained for this tactic I've been to medieval times I know how this right. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. and they come in together and they charge and then they uh, pr- try to break their enemy formation and then they kind of are able to kind of wing back around and come back in and clash again so yeah, it's a lot of uh, tactics to scare them off. Uh, it looks awesome. It looks like an uh, you know, army led by uh, angels. You know, might go at the forefront. Um, but of course, yeah, another 9/11 uh, thing that occurred were the attacks. <laughs> um, so I guess we could start off with uh, asking, uh, where were you? Hmm? What were you doing? <clears throat> Oddly enough, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and was working in route sales at the time. So I was at a uh, cold storage place where they like make pizzas and then freeze them there and servicing my customer and walked inside and get the invoice signed and uh, listening to the radio that they had on in there and they talked about a plane flying into one of the buildings nobody knows what's going on yet so I'm thinking oh Cessna or something whatever flew into one of the buildings we'll hear more about it later on tonight go back out to my truck getting ready to leave lady comes running out oh my god another one's hit the second tower and I'm like yeah this is weird really close to the airport within like 20 minutes it's just deathly silent over there you don't and it's just the weirdest thing you don't miss the noise until there's no noise mm. near the airport hmm. so that was mine i had a kid who was 11 days old we just brought him home from the hospital five days ago we had to stay in NICU for about a week and hmm. that was a pretty heady <clears throat> time so hmm. old enough now to uh <clears throat> to fight in afghanistan yeah yeah news like that really uh as an aside you know Ever since then, it's kind of like anytime there's a major news, it's like breaking news. Mm-hmm. And now you pay attention a lot more. Whereas <laughs> before that, I was like, oh, plane ran into a building. Yeah, I'm sure it's an accident. No big deal. All right. So. Horrible uh, threat in your neighborhood. Uh, listen, chime in at News at 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is the threat? <laughs> I was in uh, government school. And so they rolled in the TV and, you know, we watched it for hours. It was pretty awesome. Hmm. What class was this? Uh, I think I was, I was in junior or great, no, junior high. So started in English class, and it, then it just went through the rest of the day. Changed class, look at a different TV, and uh, yeah, we watched it all day, basically. That's way better than what I experienced, because <laughs> like I was in Thurmont, Maryland, which is right near Camp David. And, of course, everybody, like, does the mental math, like, 
all right, how close am I to the nearest federal government facility? Okay, that's the next one that's going to be hit because, of course, like I'm super concerned about myself. And right. and uh, so there was like we didn't hear about it at all until it was well underway, until both buildings had been hit. And even then they still didn't turn on TVs in any of the uh, classes. And it was stupid. It was just like, and, and I don't know. Uh, I would have really wanted to have seen it like live just to, but afterwards, like the next day we were just watching, you know, clips of it and whatnot. And it was still uh, pretty insane. Mainly just the main thing you remember is the people falling out of the building, you know? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they were saying that there's an article that's coming across about, especially I think like the 200 jumpers. Um, but they say technically they didn't jump. Uh, because if they jump, that'd be considered suicide, and for insurance purposes, they don't pay out for insur- uh, suicides, right? Uh, but they wouldn't be put in such a position anyways if there wasn't a burning inferno. Yeah, it's a desperation, it wasn't a suicide. Right, right. It's not like 200 people decided <clears throat> to commit suicide that day. Right, right. <laughs> right. So, um, But that's kind of less talked about often, um, and those are kind of horrific sightings. Uh, there was one person that jumped and hit a firefighter, trying to get into the building and I can't imagine like you're going to do your thing and then all of a sudden someone drops right on top of you and dies right I had a cousin who uh, was working in the building and he was late for work that day he worked for JP Morgan and he saw a body slam against the ground on his way out of the subway and went right back in the subway and went went back home wow wow yeah it's like I've seen this movie no (laughs) no thanks yeah yeah I'm over this I'm out of here I was in high school and my history class, I was there early in the morning, and the TV's always on. So I saw the, the news come up of like a plane hit the, the Road Trade Center. And so there's camera crews already on it and showing uh, this debris coming out of the building. And then, so I'm watching it. I'm still early in classes. So it's me and like maybe the teacher so far. And then you see it on TV. The second plane is flying. And I was like, what am I watching here? And so like we saw it live on TV, hit the second tower. Um, so I guess that dismissed a conspiracy that there was no planes. I, I saw a plane, unless it was photoshopped, I don't know, by North Koreans or something. But um, <laughs> So I think uh, after that, uh, all this mass hysteria is like, what's happening, what's going, what's going on? Everybody's thinking everything's getting hit at this point. Nobody mm-hmm. knows. Because people right. heard things in D.C. were getting hit. The Pentagon got hit. All of a sudden, they're saying well, the Capitol got hit. And everyone's thinking, like, everything's getting hit. Like, we're under, like, a Pearl Harbor attack or something like that. Uh, all, all the kids, uh, we all went into the uh, gymnasium to have our parents come pick us up. I was like, my parents are at work. They don't <laughs> I'm walking home. <laughs> uh, so wait, you were, where, where were you going to school at this time? Uh, I went to, I was in Virginia, Northern Virginia. So yeah. it was like right outside of D.C. Yeah, so yeah. even closer than where I was. In I Island. wanted to go into D.C. and check it out. <laughs> I, 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 I've seen a lot of Mad Max films, so I'm thinking <laughs> this is a Mad Max road uh, coming to fruition. Um, I need to go there because I'm right next door, but I, I couldn't get on the subway. Everything was kind of closed off, and so um, I couldn't make it. But, uh, yeah, the aftermath was... Uh, What's astounding is how efficient they were with get, with accomplishing their objectives for each plane. There was right. no, like, fifth or sixth uh, unit that they had put together that took over a plane or failed to take over a plane or whatever. Like, no, the, the four teams that they sent out actually managed to do something to each plane that they entered the i think the fourth one crash landed in uh fields in pennsylvania though right but they still successfully yeah. took right. it over they until did take that it over. Point. right right so yeah. they had 100 percent success rate on you gotta, getting a hold of the plane you got to think like i guess if these people around this plane are probably thinking hey um they're just hijacking the plane uh for ransom right. probably gonna be in a lifetime movie or something like that um, and it's going to be interesting. You're going to have like squad teams come in and take them out, right? They're not thinking they're going to crash this plane. Right. I'm thinking if they knew that, yeah, they would have been. Let's do something, just like the, the people on that uh, fourth plane in Pennsylvania, uh, where they ta- try to tackle them and, and fight them. Um, which maybe in a way they save more lives, preventing that plane hitting. I don't know what other targets they could. They were gone. saying that maybe the Capitol. That one's either the Capitol or the White House. Oh, I think was for that one, but. Bush was in Florida, I think, at the time, doing doing a kindergarten speech or something. Right. He was reading a book upside down on TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's the one picture there when he hears, the, and it was posted the other day, when I don't, I don't know who the gentleman was who's speaking in his ear. And it's like, you, you say what you want to about Bush, 
and I waffle a lot because I don't like to think that anybody is that inherently evil, you know. The, 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 his ex facial expression in that one picture says, you know, I'm not saying he didn't know what might have been the broader picture happening, but I think when he found out how it was going down, that kind of even shook him a little bit, maybe. So, yeah, he, the, you look at him, and <clears throat> the guy walks up to him, and apparently he tells him that, you know, two buildings have just been attacked. We're, we're under attack, essentially. Yeah. And he just opens the book up and like continues, you know, he doesn't be like, all right, sorry, kids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> got to go do some presidents. Uh, got to go protect America. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, he was kind of unaware and caught off guard by a lot of this. A lot of this. So, I mean, there's some stuff in which they say the, there's government involvement and possibly, but I don't think, I think Bush is kind of like the puppet kid. He can barely speak English sometimes. Yeah. Um, don't misunderestimate me. One of his favorite uh, Bushisms. And having the strategic meetings. So right. right. I love yeah. strategic meetings. That he does all the right. <laughs> you got Dick Cheney, I think, pulling the strings. You got a lot of people behind there pulling the strings. I think he's just kind of a face sit in, um, in a way for them to get in power, leftover people from like uh, his father's era, perhaps. Um, or maybe uh, Ron, he could, Rumsfeld, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, maybe that uh, plane from Pennsylvania was going to go ahead uh, building number seven, right? <laughs> With explosive, we're already ready for it. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, uh, well, uh, just wait until, <laughs> wait until they start falling and then we'll set it off and nobody will Pull it. Right. That is weird. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracies. Maybe there wasn't any dynamite or anything like that, but building number seven falling on its own, that's a little suspicious, mm -hmm. all right? Um, or the, where's the airplane at the Pentagon? Right. I mean, they say they found some airplane parts. Okay, you know, maybe can, they can put them out there afterwards. But at the same time, in the same token, because they also found passports of the hijackers that were uh, unscathed, right? It's like, it's like someone like kind of dropped it there. It's kind of like um, what the Zimmerman letter that they faked uh, from... Um, JFK assassination. No, from oh. <laughs> isn't it the what Zimmerman it, Zimmerman letter or tele, telegraph is from else. Mexico? They're saying that well, Mexico, the Germans sent a message to Mexico to help oh. them start the war, right? And uh, the British said that we uh, intercepted this encrypted message, uh, this telegram, the Zimmerman telegram, and it was like just cause now to go to war against Germany, the U.S. because. Uh, during World War One, because look, they're trying to incite uh, a war on the border. John great great grandfather was the NSA advisor during World War One. I. I guess I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a it was a monumental moment. I think, like you know, everybody kind of thinks about bef the way people thought about this type of thing before then and then after, and it's just incredible when you think about how these this group of middle class, you know, uh, Middle Eastern men, most of whom were Saudi Arabian who managed to pull this thing off and kind of give a black eye to the United States and how great, you know, we are. And they, they brought those things down. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is like a major turning point, you know, and you talk to different people we know, uh, like, you know, Rachel, whoever, and she's like, I, I don't remember it happening. And yeah, right. which it is, is odd. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, you were three years old, I guess when it happened. I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, my kid's 18. Right. He was 10 days old when it happened. So. Yeah. Yeah. So they're born into a world of constant war, or right? like this is a perpetual thing that's always going on. Uh, whereas before that, you had some Gulf War attacks that ended in like what in two days, what hundred hours or something like that. Yep. Uh, very fast. Uh, not like Grenada, huh? Grenada. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not like long lasting. We're gonna be there for for perpetuity, which we have been now. Right. Um, I think um, I would have definitely bought stock in Lockheed and Raytheon. Yeah, and Raytheon yeah. and my father worked at Raytheon. So yeah, um, if I would have known, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of these people did know because you could look at some of the things that happened before then, like uh, Rumsfeld announcing the loss of uh, <laughs> what, how much trillions money? over two point three trillion two point yeah. three trillion dollars. I mean, that can't be no coincidence that the day before the attacks, he announces that, and you would think that it'd be all over the media. Um, but incidentally, that plane or missile uh, hit the area where all the archives, the records the, are, yeah. the records are, hmm. right? Hmm. Yeah, too much of a coincidence, I think, for for that to kind of happen too. But people screech conspiracy theory at people that question stuff. I don't understand. <laughs> like, it's mind-boggling. All right, I, I I accept the fact that uh, this Muslim terrorist attacked uh, did, did these things. Um, were there also, what about their intelligence connections, like the Pakistani ISI and, you know, all the other, you know, 
I, th I think uh, like the CIA and things like that maybe have come across some other agencies. That was some problem. There wasn't like uh, cross information being shared. But I think there might have been, been something where they just let it happen. Thank God right. we've got the TSA now, man. I'm right. Fine. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Where would I be without the TSA? So great. <laughs> if I'm having a bad day, I know I can at least get to second base. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> they can now go to Amtrak trains. So they why are all a... these incel people so upset? Right. Like they should yeah. just right. get a go, passport. Just get a man. couple of flights. You'll be good. <laughs> or just, yeah, you don't need to even get a flight. You can really just. Or no, you do have to have a flight. That's right. You have yeah, to have a plane ticket. I think ticket. you have to like prove. But if you, you didn't have there. a boarding pass, they'd probably give you a little bit extra thorough. You know, <laughs> this looks suspicious right. there for a minute. No, you can go Cali to search. Amtrak. They you don't have to wait at the airports. Their now whole mission has extended to some weird transportation agencies where uh, they can go now to Amtrak and check you. They'll be riding with you in the Ubers before long, man. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Don't give them ideas. All right. They, right. I've heard them go to uh, stadiums uh, near airports just checking stuff out now. So they're yeah. kind of expanding their scope. Um, and, of course, like how many terrorists have they caught? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Zero. Right. <laughs> so every time the market comes up with a solution, the government's going to have to be, you know, piggyback off of it because they got to create jobs, too. Right. Yeah. So... Like you say, the Uber, yeah, well, gotta, I mean, it, the safety it, rider. If it moves, tax it. If it keep no, if it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. If it stops moving, subsidize it. That's that's our government. And people are so conditioned in this idea of well, um, no, that's a privilege. Like you want to get on that flight, or you want to get in your car, or you want to do this, or you want to do that. That's a privilege, and so you just uh, you you know agreed to that right. when you were it's born your or something, contract, man. right? You signed in blood somewhere, I'm sure. I mean, these, these airports aren't run by governments anyways, right? I mean, they're run by private interests. It's like saying Netflix is a, it's a privilege. Or it's like, um, we're get, we'll get into it in a second. with I the better. some may actually be run by the municipalities that they're in. I know Charlotte's is run by Charlotte government. I guess you do have, um, what, the federal know, airline, FAA? FAA right. Yeah, kind of be in charge of all that, unfortunately. Um, and there's some weird stuff that was going on September 11 where they were doing some kind of drills, and so all the jets were kind of out of range, coincidentally, right? It's kind of or confused me. beyond belief, right? And it's like because we spend more money on defense defense than any country in the world, added up mostly, yeah. and uh, they let these insurgents hijack airplanes and fly them into buildings. You would think when it's information is being led that there's some people who are interested in flying chestnuts uh, in planes, but they don't have a care about how to yeah, land them. Land this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, that will cause That's us the challenge. Sound some alarms or anything like that. Um, or maybe we're so used to, in this part of the world, with two oceans, uh, a, a great defensive barrier that we can't fathom anyone coming to attack us. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I guess maybe our defense is kind of relaxes. We think the front is always going to be out in Europe or Japan where all those bases are. Yeah, right? we didn't experience any of the suffering of World War II and rebuilding and everything. We were just back to normal right away. I mean, even yeah. Pearl Harbor wasn't, I mean, Hawaii wasn't a state, you know, it was right. a military base. Huh. So mm -hmm. when Pearl Harbor was attacked. So even then you say, well, what about Pearl Harbor? So, well, that predates the U.S., having anything to do with Pearl Harbor. Like there. Midway, that was, there's nothing there. <laughs> no. right. The Battle of Midway, well, it's, there's nothing yeah, it's there. literally the refueling point because we can't go <clears throat> all the way. <laughs> uh, Jeff Dice had a great quote about 9-11. He says, uh, on 9-11, the entire U.S. national security apparatus failed. All airport security, nuclear missiles, air defense, command centers, bombers, fighter jets, aircraft carriers, destroyers, and so on, could not protect a single American from a small group middle-class Saudi kids with box cutters and a few hours of Cessna training. And uh, so it, you know, it becomes this like, but instead of being humbled by all of that, U S government's like, no, no, we're going to press on. Yeah. Right. What were the consequences of September 11? Right. More freedoms. No. Well, I mean, you go back, it, it was either a conspiracy or a catastrophic failure. There is no third choice. You know, it's, which is it? Choose, choose your poison there. Cause they're both poison. And a lot of people died no matter which poison you choose. So. And a lot of people died all around the world, right? I mean, well, <clears throat> the overreaction. Right. <clears throat> I mean, I would think that people would want uh, justice after that, right? People would want a uh, response to that. 
I think the proper response going to Afghanistan and trying to, I guess if ta Taliban were involved with uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, justified. Uh, but then you have, weirdly enough, you have uh, the White House press asking them questions saying, hey, uh, the Taliban says they have Osama bin Laden. They're, they're, <laughs> they'll give him up. <laughs> they say, please don't bomb us. And even during the bombing, it's like, please stop bombing us. We'll hand him over to you. Yeah. Um, it's like, you're saying this is what's the cause of this. Yeah, here he is. But of course, like the White House press were like, uh, yeah, no comment on that. Uh, this is like it's an unconditional uh, destruction, you can say, that is going Shock to be occurring. Awe, I believe, was After the, the first two weeks of Afghanistan, it was pretty much we'd taken out like a bunch of guys, and that was it, it would have been over. At that that should have been it, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you say still we. have your playing cards, though? <laughs> I mean, right. Well, the people of Iraq suffered more for 9 11 than the people of the United States. Right. You know, the people of any other country, and they had virtually nothing to do with it. It's like uh, Canadians being involved in a terrorist attack in Europe, and they attack us in the United States, for example. And, you know, they're still here 18 years later. Right. right. It's like, uh, come on. Um, yeah. Right. I understand. I think most of them what was like 14 out of 17 hijackers were from uh, Saudi Arabia. There's no punishment there. Right. A lot of military connections are, are done there. A lot of the finances is done there. Prince Bandar, of course. Who, uh, who, so he, he was this guy who was living in like San Diego or something. I'm sure you know more about this, but the, uh, and he was, yeah, like he was connected to the flight training that some of these, these guys were getting. And he's, this, there's this crazy story of, of this. And I'm not one of the guys who like looks for this type of thing, but it does, it is verifiable. And, uh, he, they, uh, he's on a flight to like Saudi Arabia the day before 9 11 and, there's just uh, there's too many connections between the Saudi royal family and the Bushes for this to be to make sense that all of that happened and uh, the way it did. But. It's like in a way to get rid of their uh, enemies. I don't know what their relationships were with Iraq or anything like that, um, or oil uh, and treatments and trying to get access to that, right? Um, but yeah, I think uh, the way they went into Iraq and all of a sudden they say like everybody has families. They're in, they're in the army, they're in the police, and all of a sudden the next day it's like, yeah, you're all out of a job. Uh, good luck with that. And the only person that's holding it all together, right? I mean, these are kind of tribal. They're not like the whole place in Iraq is like Iraq. Everybody identifies. There's like a lot of different tribal stuff going on there. And there's like one person, cruel, of course, um, holding it together as a strong arm man. But um, it dissolves into something chaotic. Uh, something which, like, uh, what are these men are going to do now? Now that they're out of a job, uh, they can't support their families. Um, you know, the whole thing kind of turns to mess. The whole entire society has been uh, undone. Um, what I don't know what the kill count has been for Americans in Iraq, but I think it's been a, what two thousand more than two thousand. Um, just a if little bit more, you I think. Include yeah. civilian contractors I mean, and military. Who knows what the number is? Right. The, and then know. overall, this kind of <clears throat> spread out through uh, all of the Middle East. Uh, it's weird because it's like a playbook from like Palpatine from Star Wars where there's a national security uh, endangerment and then they have to create emergency powers, which is what Bush did uh, to kind of justify kind of going out there. Uh, he's able to create the Patriot Act. Uh, there is, I think, uh, Dick Cheney as Jar Jar Binks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Obama, is it Obama that renewed the NDAA? I think yeah. that's him, right? Yeah. Uh, National Defense Authorization Act, in which uh, they can kind of arbitrarily say anyone here is a terrorist. Is that the Patriot Act? Or is that something different? It's mm. an extension of it, basically. Yeah. Um, that guy managed to get a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, uh, un most unbelievable presidency of all time. When you look at how, how he expanded on the Bush foreign policy, didn't pull it back at all, and uh, managed to continue... Uh, he, he built up the drone policy where they were just assassinating people, essentially killing teenagers on purpose. Right. And uh, yeah, incredible guy. I was uh, a nice smile and charisma will take you anywhere. Right. Right. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. I was full too. I was a Republican um, before Obama, and then uh, I was. He was talking about closing down Guantanamo Bay. He was talking about a lot of stuff like peace, like ending everything. Uh, so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll vote for him. Uh, and I did. That's the last time I ever voted. It was in, uh, what, 2008 wow. uh, for Obama. Uh, thinking, like, all this was 
going to end, but he never even did close Guantanamo Bay. And that was like one of his first kind of campaign promises is kind of putting out there. Like the first hundred days and then you got to day 300 and it's still on the list. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the left is notoriously bad at holding their own accountable. The right is just as bad. They'll, def- they'll defend just the most absurd positions. So it's just mind boggling. I hate it. Right. Yeah. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know why people think that their side is above criticism, but if somebody's has something legitimate to say you should listen to it and look examine it i don't know because mm-hmm. politics is sports you, you choose your jersey and that jersey can do no wrong you know yeah lamar jackson can do no wrong <laughs> that's, what, that's what i'm saying right, right. circuses john <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, there's Operation Northwood, which kind of leads credence to maybe some of these conspiracies in which they were going to plan uh, fake terrorist attacks emanating from uh, Cuba, mm-hmm. as if they're going to come out here and do all these kind of uh, like horrific crimes and then justify war, right? And JFK at the last minute say, ah, let's not do that. Well, um, then there's Operation <laughs> Mockingbird, which is how they infiltrate p- parts of the media so they can control the narratives and everything like that. So... When a person has questions about these just events that go on that you should look at them and try to examine them, you get ridiculed as a non-thinker or a conspiracy theorist when you're the one that's actually like trying to look into it in a way where you can find out information that goes on. It's really like the, it's, it's expanding the idea of schooling to society at large like oh you're an idiot because you're asking this question like haven't you been in a classroom where your the teacher is like oh why are you asking that uh that's not a good question or i don't know yeah (laughs) and then the class laughs at you or something right yeah and uh that's that's like that's what society we've created (laughs) right if you didn't have a flag waving outside of your house after september 11 it's like that's very unpatriarchal of you right right uh, and then, like everybody had like what a hundred lapel pins on their you know shoots afterwards. That's and that's been going on for the past eighteen years. Right. Mm-hmm. Every Sean Hannity out there has got right. <laughs> yeah. It's like medals. <laughs> so I think that feeds into the cancel culture and the outrage. Just if it's not one way, it's the other. You're either just tribally defensive of everything or you think that everything is an outrage and must be destroyed right yeah i think um at this point i mean you think it should be evident that it's time to withdraw or get out um i think there's been some has it, has there, did trump actually come through with some troop withdrawals uh so from my understanding, he's trying he bumped it up to 15,000 and it's back down to under just like 9,000, so just under 10,000. And so he does his politician speak and says that that's a win. I say that that's the same as Obama. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Um, at least he, cr- yeah, he hasn't limited the drone policy at all. No, he's expanded it so, pretty significantly. Right. Well, not him. He's had a laissez faire ha- attitude towards the intelligence agencies and just allowed them to do what they think is necessary. And they'll always do more. as much to, yeah. They got to get paid. They got to get more money. Right. They got to spend that money so you, you can just, get more you money. You got to spend the budget, or otherwise they'll take it from you next year. Right. I mean, at least it's a good thing that he got rid of Bolton, though, right? But unless he, he, he put him in there. To, <laughs> unless he decides to give Pompeo the dual <laughs> jobs. Yeah. You're just like, well, we, we, the way every one of these guys runs an anti war campaign, because they know Americans aren't interested in fighting the world's battles, you know? Even W, I mean, said. We don't want to be the world's policeman. Nation building. He's like, no nation building. Right. Was his thing. Right. And I mean, could you look at his presidency and see anything but building up the nation of Iraq into a democracy? No, right? I don't see him building anything. He just crushed it. Yep. Right. And then you get hypersensitive right. things like this. Like, what's up with the cut of his suits? Because that <laughs> is, I'm serious. If you look at that, it's like, man, you just really are almost 1960s. German, Russian, whatever cut with these ridiculously long coats he's wearing halfway down to his knees. Hmm. And it's like, you're getting this from somewhere, dude. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. That might have been the best special. suits. You won't believe the yeah. cut of these suits. <laughs> the his best. ties are this really long, too. Huge. He's really overcompensating <laughs> with the length of those ties. You think so? Yeah. 
And well, he's got the small hands. So. <laughs> now, believe me, they're big. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe he did that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, this is a lesson maybe perhaps that we've learned that uh, you can't force our culture into other countries. I think that's what we're trying to do over there and trying to make them be like America and say, hey, this is a, how we do things. You should be able to do it too and, and just respect their culture that it's, it's not. It's not the same thing. It's kind of alien. It's kind of foreign. Maybe they're not ready. Um, there's a thing with saying that um, maybe having a IQ is a part of it, uh, or maybe having a certain types of people are readily available to kind of take that up. And when you like massacre a lot of them, it's going to be difficult for them to kind of. I mean, we've pushed out that. all their best people, right? So yeah. a lot of the a lot of the doctors and um, you know accountants and whatnot in Iraq were Christians, right. and a lot of them got pushed out because. Right. Um, they were being just, you know, after this fall of the government, they were protected by Saddam. So they end up uh, leaving and going to the United States or bringing their talents elsewhere. Same deal with Venezuela, you know. Right. And, and then uh, the local, the government there can, oh, well, we don't have any of these people to. They say the same thing about Haiti, too. Like their best talents, like we're not staying here, we're leaving. Right. Right. Well, yeah, if you have the means, of course, you want to make a better life for your, your family, your immediate future. You have to flee if you have the ability to, and then that leaves behind the people that don't have the skills to do so. And then it breeds the worst type of culture. The intervention is the, the problem because you exacerbate the, the whole thing. You force migrants out. Why would you? I wouldn't stay in a place in the U.S., that like if Virginia was being bombed by Maryland, I wouldn't stay in Virginia. First, I would try to fight back and stop it. But right. Dan if Yanks. it was, you know, if it was uh, Baltimore, is their training? I would burn Just my like, I would burn my ribs. <laughs> That's what I would do as my sign of the hell with yeah. insurgency. <laughs> Just have you uh, you you pick the best option, then you move from there. If that doesn't work. It's just how it works. I yeah, think. we have no idea how difficult it's been for the people who live there. You know, they had a kind of a semblance of civilization, and now it's been completely destroyed. And But one of the things that I think about, and I've been, I watch a lot of YouTube videos lately about uh, these guys who are like former military, went to Iraq and Afghanistan, have a bunch of training, and now they're training just civilians on the, on the market, so open market. Insurgency knitting group? Right. And, or the Mongoose Club? Right. I, I listened to that one podcast, the Biting the Bullet podcast, right. and so many of these guys, and you're like, talk about blowback. Like, I see, <laughs> I, you know, you see, like, okay, uh, we look, we, we, we saw what they did with bin Laden and the Russians in the 80s and Afghanistan. And, well, what happens when you send a, when you train a bunch of guys in the Middle East, they get all this, like, room clearing ability and, and all this training, and then they bring it back to the United States and start training Americans how to do this stuff. Seems like a, a recipe for the government's own disaster, like the own collapse. Right. Thank because God for Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> right? right? Right. Good. Good uh, segue. Yeah. <laughs> you set it up. <laughs> on that note. Um, I mean, I guess that is a good point. I mean, uh, you can say we did train us on Bin Laden. Um, I mean, he's like the son of like a millionaire, right? Or a billionaire, yeah. billionaire right? Well, but that's history, even going back to the 80s with the Shah of Iran. We, you know, we put him in power. 1953. And then he quit listening to us, so we trained the Qaddafi's people. Exactly. Not Qaddafi, he's Libya. Yeah. yeah. Khomeini. And put him in power. Destabilizing the region. I guess like the Saudi is just like a long line of kings or something or, or, or line of family, uh, Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, they control it. I guess at some point there was a time where they didn't and there were other kind of monarchies and there was other kinds of political geographic areas in which these tribes had their own place. But then you had, um, I think it was England that kind of messed everything up after like... Forced inclusion, forced diversity. Right. And say, well, we're just going to draw a circle here, and you're all going to have to like, get along. It's like, but we don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these were not nation states. Like, they were not the, oh, this is our border, and it's been that way for 500 years. Like, they right. didn't. That's not what they were about. They were like, like you look at the history of Saudi Arabia, and until they found oil, it was just a bunch of nomads. Yeah, yeah, nomadic teams who who ran around and competed for a little bit of, you know, over a little bit of sand. I mean, that was it. Right. 
Um, so yeah, a lot of involvement, I think, kind of destabilizes the region and puts people together where they shouldn't. I mean, not everyone's going to get along. Uh, that's something like we all had to tell each other when we were in boot camp. They're like, look, we're, gonna, we're stuck together for quite a long time. <laughs> Uh, we're all now going to get along together, but we got to get through this together. It's, otherwise, it's going to be a really bad experience for everyone. I uh, remember uh, if we were doing like a pep talk with each other because we had a lot of like infighting going on there. And after we had to talk about that, I was like, all right, that makes sense. And let's just get through this nightmare for a minute. Um, and it doesn't seem to be the case when you don't allow them to have their own uh, country, you can say, their own tribal region to just kind of get along with themselves. Or their ability to like decide who they interact with what's it associate with if right. they don't have the ability to d to pick who they associate with it's forced upon them you get rebellion right i think this comes goes back to this uh idea that all cultures are equal and so that's why they just draw a circle around there and uh not knowing like no there's they have their own stories and mythologies yeah. and stuff like that uh they have their own kind of truths that can only be related within their own people uh, that the other tribes just have no idea anything about, yeah. uh, which would just create kind of conflict. It took centuries. It took centuries for Catholics and Protestants to get over. I mean, the, their differences. Have we? So, and, and even still, yeah. you get a lot of <laughs> flaming on social media, right? Yeah. I'm in this libertarian Christian group on uh, Facebook, and it's like they're rehashing the differences between Augustine's view of blah blah blah. And you're just like, guys, it's you know, like oh, you it's 2019. Know, you, you don't have to go. Protestant Catholic, you can go Baptist Methodist. Oh yeah, you, know you can go Baptist Baptist like yeah, about you can go, the tiniest yeah, you topics. Can go. <laughs> I had a Jehovah Witness come to my house actually uh, t uh, yesterday, and uh, oh, and I was knocking on the door. And he was, won't be back. He messed up. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was great. No, it's fine. It's like it was like uh, I'm waking up. It's like I'm in my robe. It's like can I help you? I was like, as I knew who they. Oh yeah. It's like well you know um here's a we wanted to talk about uh God. And it's like yeah. It's like well. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. So he's like, I know you're kind of tired. I don't know what kind of was. I was like, well, who created uh, who created Earth? I was like, God. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I was like, good talk. Uh, <laughs> Check me. My work here is done. I'll see you at Kingdom Hall <laughs> in a week. <laughs> you're one of the first 144,000. All right. They're like, huh, right. Uh, yeah, they're like, okay, I guess. Good conversation. Yeah, good conversation. God bless. <laughs> But I do like Jehovah's Witness in a way because doing some research about them, they're very anti-war, they're yeah. very anti-military, they're very, um, uh, they protest, again, what do they call them, uh, conscientious objectors, objectors. Yeah, yeah, much of the bane of the military. Uh, my brother Alvaro, going to law school, says he found so many legal opinions about them because they keep meddling into their affairs about rejecting involvement uh, into other countries and get involved with mm -hmm. war. Um, I guess the Quakers might have a similar kind of help you as well, uh, which is would be great, you know, if, if you could in the military kind of opt out. It's like, yeah, I'm here to safeguard in America. I don't know what these people are doing, so you can kind of opt out of that. And those who want to go in there, they're like, yeah, that's not a lot of us. Right. It's difficult because in order to prove that you're a conscientious objector, I think you need to say, well, I'm against all war for any reason, not just this war. And mm -hmm. so it, for uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's easy for them to say that, whereas other groups might have a more difficult time saying, well, there is a war in my imagination that I would participate in. And that's, that's the struggle. But, uh, like I, you know, if, if you were a Catholic or whatever, it would be the, the Pope hasn't always opposed uh, every war. Right. So, right. Um, like, uh, the crusades, <laughs> <laughs> the only oh, yeah, just yeah. war, <laughs> <laughs> a just war. Um, but yeah, we're coming close to, to wrap here. And I think, um, 18 years has definitely been too long to continue to be out there in the Middle East and for phosphorus weapons and, you know, generations obliterated. Uh, and for people like our friend Rachel, all she knows is war. And it's like, like for her, I imagine for her, it's like it's always been that way. And it's never always been that way. And it shouldn't continue to be that way. Um, I think uh, maybe having brutal conversations like yeah we shouldn't be out there and i think most people kind of come to that conclusion but you know it's really hard to see that kind of withdrawal still happening for some reason um do you think part of that's because they don't want to see the war fought here i think it's no i think it mm. might be something about being like you know how they had this tough on crime mm -hmm. they don't want to be seen weak on terrorism 
right? They don't want no politician will say, yeah, let's withdraw. But they like, may- are you saying like we fight over there, so we don't well, have no, to no, fight no, here? That, yeah, that, that something yeah, along that those lines. Argument. Yeah, because you know, it's real easy to support an, a battle that's two thousand miles from my front door, but do they want to give up the that two thousand miles? There's without nothing. ever considering the third option that there might just not be a battle. Right. You know, right. they don't necessarily hate you. We're over there attacking them. Right. Or I mean, our government's got us over there. Oh, no. Them. But if we leave, the whole place will get even worse trouble, turmoil. And I said, good. Let them figure it out. That's their story. You know, 100 years from now, they'll be talking about it. Like, yeah, we went through a lot of turmoil, but eventually we got our you know, shit right. together. Right. Uh, you look at um, oh, Somalia. It took like a few years. They got their shit together before government came back in again. And they were doing great. And I think maybe that could be something that uh, could be said for that, too. You know, there's patterns of behaviors. You kind of see that. Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially. If the, Pas- if the Pashtuni tribes successfully rebel, who they thought that were the Russians when we first came, <laughs> you know, they could probably be a su- first successful ANCAP nation. And uh, it will be a mecca for everybody to go and get, you know, your latest tech and everything. <laughs> That's something I, I, I recently came across, like Stan, like Pakistan. Estan means land. So I don't know. That. I'm like, what are they all calling themselves? Like, you know, Islamist, Islamist band or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. It just means land. So all right, that makes sense. And cap land. Yeah. And Capistan. <laughs> cool. They're the most successful of all the repelling of foreign foreign invaders. Almost all the big nation states have been repelled by them. So right. it's pretty impressive. They say Afghanistan is uh, the empire, uh, the graveyard, graveyard of empires. Of, right. Right. Mongols couldn't take it over. The Russians <laughs> couldn't take it over. Uh, when you don't really have a state, it's, you're just you're fighting against guerrilla decentralized warfare. resistance, right? Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, stay liberated. Get off my property. <laughs> <laughs>